morning it's good to see you beautiful day isn't it if you listen to the announcements and heard Reggie this will make a little sense to you I happen to be a neighbor of Reggie's which is usually fairly a benign existence but but the weather that God I get it too so I got all that heavy wet snow which is actually beautiful it's amazing it's awesome moisture and it's pretty much all gone and uh, the green grass is coming along and we're grateful for what God does to renew us. Amen? It is, it is in that backdrop that I want to say a couple of things and then we'll get back in the normal routine. This morning is going to be different. He announced earlier we're having communion so uh, if you want to participate at any time just get up and go get one of those communion cups. We're also going to have some notes. For those of you who are watching us online, if you're on our website, you, there's, a, there's a note-taking guide like this on the website. If you're on Facebook or, or YouTube, you're on your own, you can go back to the website and get that later. Uh, but you can watch this later. There's some things I just thought you might want to, you might not be able to remember exactly, and you might want to have written down. We'll see your call, obviously. I'm also aware today that, that our world is in crisis and teetering on the edge. And uh, we need to be mindful of that. Um, I, I, I'm not panicked about that. Uh, I'm not over predicting what that is or what that may mean yet. I don't think we know, but we wanna pray. So at the end of the message, which is about praying, we're gonna take a few minutes and pray. And we're certainly gonna pray for as God commands us in his word to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Wow, that's a cogent prayer right now. And pray for God's direction over all of us, including us. And then we're gonna segue into receiving communion, the Lord's Supper. So that's a sort of a lot of stuff. And it's probably gonna take me four hours Not quite, but, but uh, I, I've got I've to get started. And so, by the way, welcome back. So many of you who come from Arizona, Texas, and other parts south, and you're back with us today. Welcome home. Good to have you back with us. Thank you so much. And you picked a good day. Of course, you probably came back last weekend. But anyway, uh, uh, <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is wonderful, wonderful time. Great to have you back. We're really good to see you guys. And, and speaking of weather, you, you, you heard about the cowgirl that came in the house? She said, I think I'm hearing voices. Her husband said, what? She said, yeah, I'm pretty sure. I heard the dirt saying to the rain, if you don't stop that, my name's going to be mud. <laughs> See, you laugh at stuff like that. That's the issue. I mean... We all know it's no good, but you laugh and it encourages me to keep going. So there you, there you, there you go. Today we're going we're gonna to talk, we're, we're going to start a whole new series, and we're, we're in Matthew chapter 6, for, and, and it's part of the Sermon on the Mount, and specifically what we have come to know as the Lord's Prayer, although it's actually the pattern of prayer for us. And the disciples at one point said to Jesus, teach us to pray, teach us to pray, and, and we, we do that. Now, let me, be, let me be up front to say, the Lord's Prayer is, not, is a pattern and fundamentals. It's suggestive more than it is prescriptive. So what I'm saying to you is, the way you're praying is probably not wrong. When you're connecting with God and having a conversation with God, go for that. Don't limit yourself to formal, official prayers that are super religious. God wants a relationship with you. God is okay to hang out with you and have a conversation with you, right? On the other hand, you can learn patterns and principles that help guide that because most of us have misplaced priorities when it comes to pray. Smile. I'm talking about you. That just we, we, we start with me and my gimme list. And God's going to say there's a better place to start 
that puts you and your gimme list into perspective. So let's, let's do that. We're going we're gonna to read a passage uh, out of Matthew 6, and I can't spend a lot of time on most of this, but Jesus says, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. First of all, this just cracks me up. I mean, these are people who pray. I think I'm, I've, I've met some of these people. Um, I'll, I'll not call anybody's name right now, maybe, but I've met some of these people, and, and, and they pray big, swelling, pretentious prayers and want to impress you that they know big theological words and have this wonderful diction. And some of those prayers are actually beautiful and meaningful and, and, and may indeed be connecting with God. But Jesus is saying, don't pray to put on a show. Praying in front of others is acceptable. Okay, parents praying in front of their children is a really wonderful model. Uh, I, I try to model prayer as a pastor. Other those, it's it's okay. It's not against that, but he's saying don't make that your goal to pray in front of others. Watch this, and, and, and to be seen by others. He says this. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. In other words, somebody saw them. That's all they get out of that. Now, when you pray. Go into your room. Some translations will have it, as you know, go into your closet. He's talking about an inner, out-of-sight place. Understand the, the, the contrast here. Instead of on the street corner or standing up in church and praying, he's saying, do this privately, do this quietly, and close the door and pray to your Father who's unseen. Let me just make sure. This is one of those places where I've known people who take this super literally who think that they have to go into a designated closet to pray. And to my knowledge, Jesus never went into a closet to pray. We have no record of that. So, and Jesus is the one who's talking, right? So he's giving you a principle. He, Jesus went to the mountains to pray, which I think way cool. Um, and, and, and so I'm just saying to you, if you have that designated room, spot, place, pray, but the problem with that is sometimes when you need to pray, you're not there. And Jesus would say, when you learn to connect with God and relate with God, prayer becomes an ongoing conversation with God rather than a specific place and time so much. Think about that. Watch this. So you, you, you go into the secret place, he says. Then your father who is unseen, then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Let's go to the next one, please. And when you pray, <laughs> do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. <laughs> so by the way, when you're praying, understand who your audience is. You're talking with God. It's not your role to impress other people. It's talking with God. But I heard a great quote the other day from T.D. Jakes who said, so many people pray as if we needed to inform God. <laughs> and I'll just confess right now, I've been guilty. I tell God exactly what I need and how I need it and when I need it and why I need it. Hello? Anybody? Or how somebody else says and kind of, kind of, you know, God, you could do this, you could do this. Hello? T.D. Jakes would say, prayer is not about informing God. Prayer is about inviting God into your circumstance. Oh, that's good. So instead of, you, it's okay, it's okay to say to God, here's the problem as I understand it. Because sometimes in doing that, God helps me to get clarity on, well, as it turns out, that's not really the problem. Or sometimes I hear God's voice saying, and whose fault is that? <laughs> yeah. Didn't want that conversation. But, but, but invite God's presence. God, here's the circumstance. I know you know all about this. I'm inviting you in a fresh and new way to really be part of this, to really connect with this. So, they think they'll be heard because there are many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Let's go to the next one. This, then, is how you should pray. So he said, don't do it for show. Don't do it to be a babbler, to just, just impress people. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's that prayer. 
I want to start there just a minute before we get to kind of, kind of what's on your notes. First of all, let's just start with God chooses to reveal himself to, to us as a father. We, have a, we live in a current turmoil of a world where we have an amazing amount of gender confusion. And let me just say that God is not at all confused. He created human beings in his image, male and female. He created them. He's crystal clear on that. Wasn't confusing then, really isn't confusing now. Uh, it, it, it's pretty simple. Except God is not transgender. He transcends gender. Think about that. God is a spirit, so he portrays himself to us as a father. There are places where he says, as a mother, I nurtured you, I nourished you, but he portrays himself generally to us as a father, and Jesus, with all of his amazing, Jesus, of course, the only begotten son of the father, uniquely that, but he says to his disciples, when you pray, pray our father. Now, let me just pause there a moment to say, that's wonderful and warm and gracious to so many of us, and for some people, that's a real problem, because their image of father is not a good one. Some people never knew their biological earthly father. And they're saying, who, who, who is that? And God says, I can be known to you and by you. Or some people kind of wish they hadn't known their earthly father. It's painful. He wasn't good. He didn't do good. It was hurtful, painful. And for them, transferring this, let me just tell you this. I hope that you had a wonderful father. I did. He certainly wasn't perfect. And neither was yours. Except God the Father, who is the perfect heavenly Father. Completely and perfectly fulfilled and balanced, He is Father. And the big thing that he wants us to know is, I want you in a relationship with me as a son or a daughter. I want you in relationship with me as a child. I want you to be part of my family. Now, on the one hand, I was pretty proud most of the time to be a son of my father. He was a man of incredible integrity and all of that. I, 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 a couple, you know, like every kid, he did things that embarrassed me. Uh, which I tried to pass on. Um, and my kids say I was very successful. Uh, I'm just saying, earthly parents do that, right? So, but, but I was mostly proud of that. But, but I want to just tell you right now, I'm a child of God. Amen. The Father is my Father. You may not think I'm somebody, but I'm somebody. Because I'm a child of the King. I'm a child of the Lord God, sovereign almighty, who reigns forever and ever, and I'm his son. Don't mess with me. Are you with me? Son, daughter, I'm just saying, that's, that's a wonderful thing. And by the way, even when my father was not happy with me, I always had an audience with him. He always paid attention. Even when he was busy with other crowds, hey, Dad, he always listened. You have a father who cares about you and will always listen to you. So I can't belabor this point, but it just starts pretty simple. And by the way, I'm going to teach you a lot of names of God that reveal his character to us. But if you just need to keep it this simple, keep it this simple. You're good. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So now let's go to those notes and start filling in some blanks for you. And we're going to talk about the idea of hallowed be your name. And I'm going to use the word sanctify. And we're going to fill some words in there that, that, that are going to be highlighted in yellow. And those are blanks on your notes if you want to write or whatever. But to sanctify is, is what to make holy. To hallow means to make holy, to sanctify, which primarily, literally means to set it apart. It is not mixed. It is pure. It is set apart. It's not alloyed. It is set apart. It means to give it honor, and it means to elevate it. Let's spend a little time right there. He's saying to us, I want my name to be honored. I want, my, I want you to make God's name holy. So it's my prayer. I'm, I'm going to just model a little bit. 
when I have some time to pray, especially if I'm set aside maybe an hour or maybe a day, that I'm just going to hang out with God and just pray, I just start by hallowing the name of God. And the list of names I'm going to give you, I've memorized about 30 of those. And, and I'm going to give you some, and I don't expect you to memorize 30, but I'm just saying you, you'll have some you can take a list with you. And, and just start hallowing, honoring his name, worshiping his name, and realizing this is who he is. God chose to reveal himself to us through many names that have commonality to show us the completeness of who he is. And when I worship his name, I honor it, I set it apart, I elevate it. And sometimes I just let God's spirit prompt me to bring names. Ah, uh, yeah. I'm going to talk to you next week, next Sunday, God willing, for instance, about the name Jehovah Rophe, which is God my healer. And I was praying for some of you this morning, and I've got a couple of aches and pains I was praying for God's help on. And so I just started today by hallowing God's name. You are Jehovah Rophe. You are the God who heals me. Which put me in perspective to say, ha ha, I'm pretty good. He is the God who heals me. It's like his name. So I'm honoring and hallowing his name. Do you get that? I'm going to give you some specifics. Again, I'll be back to that one next week, God willing. But will you honor and elevate? Let, let me get to some, some historic perspective. For many, many, many years, until the, the Gutenberg Press, etc., the, the, the Word of God was hand-copied. And one of the amazing, we would say miraculous things about the Word of God is how accurate it is. Most ancient manuscripts being hand copied to hand copied had glaring omissions or you know, whoever was copying it said nah it doesn't matter I'm not going to do that one or I think this needs to be written in but there's very very little of that in the word of God it was hand copied from manuscript to manuscript with incredible diligence and accuracy in fact as archaeologists have unearthed older and older manuscripts we find whoa isn't this amazing it's especially this back in the ancient Hebrew manuscripts so so some of them going back to close to 3,500 years ago and 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 we, we we're, we're seeing that amazing accuracy but here's here's a historic note when the scribes would come to writing out the name of God and especially a name we're going to talk about next week that when they would come to writing out that name, first of all, they avoided it if possible. If they could not write the name, it was just so holy that they were scared, this fear of God. But when they would write it, they would often change clothes and sometimes take a bath. Back in the day when you didn't take a bath every day, once a week was good. They would take a bath and put on new clothes and get out a fresh sheet of parchment, which was a big deal. They didn't have Office Depot <laughs> or Walmart. And so parchment was expensive, and they would get sometimes a fresh quill and a fresh cup of ink, and they did all of that just to copy, just to write again the name of God. Oh, boy. Fast forward to us. And on your phone somewhere is a text that has OMG on it. Now, the good news is that God is not actually the name of God. It's a title, so nobody's going to go to hell over that, I don't think. But we treat the name of God so casually and flippantly and lightly. We have so little reverence. I'm not suggesting every time you write out the name of God, you go take a bath first. I'm not, not a bad idea, but anyway... <laughs> I'm not suggesting you change clothes and get a new pen and a new piece of paper. I'm not suggesting you go to those links. I'm just saying that these people back there think, whoa, this is a big deal. And we just flip it off like it's nothing. Just something to think about. So, so he's saying when you start your prayer, so you're coming in, I'm talking to the Lord God and Jehovah Almighty. Oh boy, oh wow. I need to come with reverence and respect and honor and elevate his name. Let's go. So the first one I want to talk to you about is Elohim. And it occurs to us in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. So right up front, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that word in Hebrew is the word Elohim. And by the way, if you want to pronounce these Hebrew words, it's like Spanish pronunciation of the vowel sounds. So Elohim in Genesis, and it simply means the creator God. In the beginning, God, the grand designer, the grand architect, the grand 
the grand cause, the supreme intelligence behind all of God's intricate creation, in the beginning, Elohim was there. I love to pray this prayer. I love it especially when I'm out hunting or hiking in the mountains. Because I get around some place, now really I need to pause and get my breath, but I'm faking it like I really need to pause and worship. That's just a joke. Um, I'm actually wanting to worship. But I see some I see some view. I even just see this tree, and it's magnificent. I see this running brook, and it's just amazing. I see an elk, and I think, whoa. And I'm reminded, you are Elohim. You are the creator God. Wow. You made all this, and you let me have part of it. And you let me see it. And you let me experience it. You are the creator God. But it also reminds me when I'm in the midst of something to say this is the God who is the creator and creative and God can start over new and God can make things brand new in Genesis 1 and 2 sort of indicates that with the earth that God started over and made something new and I'm just saying he's the, that creator God who can create new things in our lives and so when you, when you think of Elohim and you may want to write down there he's the creator God. He's the God who's magnificent it also helps me, by the way, to shrink my problems into the more appropriate size. Here's the Lord God Almighty, the creator of God, who, ma who masterminded the universe. <laughs> I'll bet he can figure out my problems. What are you thinking? Are, are you with me? See, it, 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 it shrinks me and my problems to say, who am I talking to now? For instance, if I'm talking to one of you, this is different, but if I'm talking to a multi-billionaire and says, boy, I need 20 bucks, I'm pretty embarrassed, actually. Because what's 20 bucks to this guy? Are you with me? Oh, don't be embarrassed to ask God for 20 bucks. But know who he is you're talking to. He is the Lord God Almighty. He shrinks your problem into size, which helps me in my praying to say, yeah, God, I got a little problem here. Sometimes it helps me in my praying to say, God, I don't know what all you're doing in your world, your universe. It could be you're doing such big and magnificent things and I sort of got caught up in bad weather or whatever. Whatever, I'll deal with it. Do your big, do your macro picture. Do what you do. You're the Lord God Almighty, the Creator. Let's go to the next one. And the next one is a beautiful story. It's called El Roi. El Roi. It's a story. Hagar is her name. Hagar was, was, in a, was a maid to, to Sarah, Abraham's wife. And they made a series of bad choices. And she had a son. And, and um, later on, at first that started out to be a good idea. And then it wasn't a good idea. And uh, fast forward, she gets kicked out. They give her a lunch and a water bottle, but she doesn't know where to go, and they're in the middle of the desert, and she and her young son get kicked out, and they go about as far as they can go, and she's despairing. Uh, she doesn't have the skill set. She doesn't have the, the, the resources, and she's just sort of hunkered down um, and going to die. They're out of water primarily. They're going to die of thirst before they die of hunger, but they're going to die. And she and her son are there, and God shows up to speak to her and says to her, Hagar, Hagar, I see you. She's been rejected. She's been kicked out. She's been abandoned. She's in the middle of a desert wilderness. She's all alone. And she says, you are El Rohi. You are the God who sees me. And God says, by the way, just turn around and walk this way a little bit and there's a spring of water. They later dug a well there and they named it the well of the God who sees me. But here's what I want to say to you. You ever feel alone and abandoned and nobody really understands me and nobody really cares? Yes, you have. And, and uh, nobody really has this all figured out and nobody, nobody even notices. He is El Roi. He's the God who sees you. And when, it doesn't, when he says see you, it's not just glance at you and look away. No, he sees you. 
He sees everything about you. He sees the circumstances. He says to Hagar, I know what's happened to you. I know the whole story. I know all it's about. And by the way, I know the future ahead of you. And I know the generations ahead of you. And I'm going to support you and nourish you and take care of you. And your son's going to grow up. And he's going to be the father of many, many nations. And, and some of them are fighting right now. But I'm just telling you, the fact of it is, he's the God who sees you. Wow. Do you see why he, when he says, hallow his name means to worship his name. Set it apart. Make it holy. Elevate it. Give it significance and honor. He's the God who sees me. He actually knows about me and you. Isn't that cool? It's the God who sees me. Let's go to the next one. And that is El Shaddai. El Shaddai, and you're going to find it over in Psalm. I'm just the, not the only references to these, but find it's normally translated in our English translations, the Almighty. It's a little more accurate to say the all nourishing God. He's the God who completely cares for me. Yes, he's almighty in power, but the word El Shaddai does not emphasize power, actually, as much as, as it emphasizes care and nourishment and nurture. He is the God who has everything I need. He nurtures me. He nourishes me. Huh. See, later on in the Lord's Prayer, we'll get to it, where God says, there's this prayer because give me today my daily bread. Huh. I'm praying to whom? To El Shaddai, the God who has all supplies and who nourishes me. Now I'm going to go off script and confuse you a little bit and you can just jot down notes or not or whatever. You can look up, you can you go back and read this later and jot, or listen to this later and, and, and jot down notes. Um, I'm, I'm, because of our world circumstances today, I'm going to introduce two other words that aren't, aren't on your script. One of them at least will be on next week. One of them is, one of the Old Testament names is God is El Elyon. I'll have it, I'll, we'll have it on a note-taking guide for you next week so you can spell it. El Elyon. And it is grammatically incorrect. Let me explain that. Because it says, he is the Lord God who is higher than the highest. You can't do that. The highest is like the highest. But as a point of emphasis, God said, but I'm God, and I will transcend your grammar. <laughs> I wish I'd have known that in school. Uh, <laughs> I am a God, and I'm bigger than your grammar, and I'm higher than the highest. Amen. That's pretty cool, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to have an election in November, and somebody's going to get elected. But whomever that is will have great authority and great power, and God says, <laughs> whatever. I'm higher than the highest. Amen. We talk about somebody being the leader of the free world, <laughs> and God says, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I'm higher than the highest. We're right now talking about who has the most rockets and who has the most whatever. And, you know, your, my, our toys are bigger than your toys. And, and, and who, who's the most powerful? And God's, God's got to be chuckling, saying, boys, boys, boys. Send a boy to do a man's job. Hm. I'm higher than the highest. He's El Elyon, people. We serve the Lord God Almighty who's higher than the highest. And another one that'll be on your note-taking guide next week is Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of battle, the Lord who guides us into that. He will say, I'll fight your battles for you. I'll fight your wars for you. I'm the Lord of hosts. I'm Jehovah Sabaoth. I've been reminded over the last few days in praying, you are Jehovah Sabaoth. You're the Lord God Almighty of the hosts of heaven. Generals and secretaries of defense can talk to each other and have plans those are probably important but he is Jehovah Sabaoth he is over all amen? amen and we have him to pray for too we want to hallow his name now we're going to segue into time of communion but I want to, I want to start with a prayer and I'm going to mention these names to hallow God's name in prayer and invite God's presence with us let's pray together Father, wow, thank you for being our Father. Thank you for letting us just be your son or your daughter. Wow, you're our Father. 
and you're in heaven. We hallow your name today. You're the Elohim. You're the grand designer, grand creator behind all of this. You're El Roi. You're the God who sees us. You have an intelligence that goes beyond anybody. You're the El Shaddai. You're the almighty, all-nourishing, all-sufficient God. For that we honor you. You are El Elyon. You are the Lord God who is the highest, higher than the highest. You're the superlative God. You're beyond our highest. And you are Jehovah Sabaoth. You're the Lord of battle. Now God, over the past few months, in the land where this was being recorded, where you were walking when you prayed this prayer, they've seen many, many deaths. Last night, just a young girl was killed. And we want to pray for those families and the people who mourn and grieve and lift them in prayer. The odds are pretty high that's not the end. We acknowledge that. We don't need to inform you about that, God. You know already what's happening and what will. But we invite you, God, to spread your peace and your justice. Sometimes you don't bring immediate peace because you want to bring right and justice. And sometimes you bring peace. And I would pray, God, today that you would bring your peace and your protection. I pray for your people everywhere. And I pray, God, that you would help us to have protection. It was a civilian who lost her life last night, but we especially, of course, pray for those in our armed services who are facing critical danger right now. And pray, God, your protection and your grace to be around them and your help to be with them and your wisdom to accompany them. Help each of us, Lord. Sometimes these kinds of things give us a lot of heart flutters and we get anxious Help us to trust in you. Help us to rely on you. You are the Lord God Almighty. We lift this to you. None of this catches you off guard or takes you by surprise. None of this you can't handle. And you have a time when you say, I will handle all of it. And I'll restore peace and righteousness. We'll cover the earth like water covers the sea. So I pray, God, for your blessing on us today. Now, Lord, we are about to receive communion. It's your supper, your prayer. And we pray right now in Jesus' name. Thank you for the sacrifice that Jesus gave for us. We pray for these elements, Lord God, that you would bless them to us. And as we receive this bread and this juice, May we by faith receive Christ Jesus into our lives and honor you and bless you and have your peace and joy. We pray that in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And now if you have that cup or if you need to go get one, You'll turn on the back side where the bread is, please. Peel that back. This bread represents to us the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is broken for you. Eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you, and be grateful. and then peel back that juice portion of that. This juice, of course, represents to us the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you know, ladies and gentlemen, that the blood of Christ 
covers all your sins. Like all of them. Like all of them. Blots them out. As far as God's concerned, never happened. Doesn't exist. His blood. I'm going to go to preaching again if I'm not careful. This is pretty awesome. I love to be forgiven. When you receive this, don't feel guilty anymore because you're not guilty anymore. When you receive this, you've been forgiven. When you receive this, you're a child of the king. When you receive this, his blood covers all your sin. Hallelujah. He shed his blood for the forgiveness of sin. Drink this in remembrance that Christ died for you. And be grateful. And now, Holy Father, thank you so much for your grace in our lives. Help us to go in the confidence and the courage. Our Father is in heaven. May your name be made holy among us today. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. What a day to praise the Elohim. He's the creator. He gave us this wonderful day. Hallelujah.